Hello, my friends. Thank you for listening to the Wesley Memorial Church podcast. This is Clark Chilton, one of our associate pastors here at the church. We're in a sermon series called Advent Preparing for Christmas. Advent is that time of year where we know it's not quite yet Christmas, and that's okay. A time of preparation, a time of waiting, a time of seeking God and drawing near to God as we take this journey together toward the manger on Christmas Eve. Christmas is a wonderful time of year. It's also a stressful time. It's a time uh, when we remember those in our past or we miss loved ones. It can be a, a time of difficulty as well, and we acknowledge that. We want you to know that we're praying for you. If you want to join us for a worship service any Sunday at 8 30, 9 45, or 11 a.m., we would love to see you. To learn more, visit wesleymemorial.org. And now here's this week's message on Advent preparing for Christmas. Our second reading for the morning comes from the prophecy of Micah. I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Micah chapter 5, or you can follow along with your bulletin. The text is printed there. Almost 700 years before the coming of Jesus, Micah the prophet wrote this. But you, O Bethlehem Ephrata, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming, is, whose coming forth is from old, from ancient days. Therefore he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. Then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel, and he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord and the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall dwell secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he he shall be their peace. This is the word of God. Friends, would you pray with me? God, it is so good to be in this place, gathered together this morning, offering worship to you. God, we thank you for the work of your Spirit. We thank you for the ways that your Spirit helps us to be focused on you during this time. We focus on your presence. We focus on your character and your goodness toward us. And because we share this time in worship, you continue to transform our lives. God, we pray that every earthly distraction will cease. We pray that you'll give us ears to hear what you're saying to us today. We thank you that we can join with the saints in heaven and offer worship to you and gather around this table. We give ourselves back to you, God. You have given us so very much. The least we can do is to give our lives to you. Through the power of the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Every Sunday, your preachers here at Wesley Memorial Church seek to preach messages that are firmly based in Scripture and that are fair to Scripture because that's central to the Christian church. Every morning on the Lord's Day, we talk about passages of Scripture, but this morning I want to spend just a few moments and talk about Scripture in general, Scripture itself, the Bible itself. We need to remind ourselves what the Bible is and how the Bible is a gift to us. Particularly during the Advent season, you probably know the tradition early from the life of the church that as we focus on Jesus, the incarnate Word, we also remind ourselves of the written Word that God has given to us. I hope that you remember this morning what Jesus said about the Scriptures, what Jesus said about the Bible. Perhaps Uh, You remember that in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, 
Jesus said, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, and that's part of the alphabet that they used, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. And then Jesus said something remarkable in John chapter 10. For those of you that uh, were with me this past Wednesday night as we continued our study on Jesus and the Jewish festivals, we were looking at that passage in John chapter 10 where Jesus is in Jerusalem celebrating Hanukkah. And when you look at the dialogue, or the, really the monologue, that Jesus delivered to the religious crowd there in the temple during Hanukkah, he said something that I believe was startling to the crowd there in his day. He said, almost as an aside, as he was talking about who he is, he said, the Scripture cannot be broken. The Scripture cannot be broken. The Greek word there, translated broken, means something like the Scripture cannot be annulled, the Scripture cannot be done away with, the Scripture cannot be found in error. So again, that's how Jesus thought about this book that we have before us. And then the Apostle Paul said something remarkable in 2 Timothy. Most of us know John 3, 16. I, I hope that we would memorize 2 Timothy 3.16. In 2 Timothy 3.16, Paul is writing to his protege, the young preacher Timothy, and Paul says this, all scripture is breathed out by God. In the Greek, it's literally one word that Paul sort of created to describe scripture, so you can translate all scripture is God-breathed. But if it's easier to understand, all Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. So that's how Jesus, and that's how Paul, viewed the Scriptures. We need to make sure that as the people of Jesus in this world, that we view the Scriptures as Jesus views the Scriptures. And for 2,000 years of Christian tradition, and now over 2,500 years of Jewish traditions, the Scriptures, what we call Old Testament, New Testament, are central to our life of faith. We know God only because God has revealed God's self in Scripture. We would know very little about God from nature. We would know He is Creator, and we know some wonderful things about God from nature. We call that natural theology. But for special revelation, we have to go to the Scriptures. And we learn specific things about God, such as God became incarnate in Jesus Christ. The Scriptures are central to who we are as a Christian people. It's rather fascinating that in our era, and really for about the last hundred years or so, uh, there's been an increasingly growing group of people who want to somehow be Christian without paying much attention to the Scriptures. And there's even some Methodists who want to be Methodists without paying much attention to the Scriptures, which is interesting because, of course, John Wesley, a name we know well here, John Wesley said that he was a man of one book. Now, he read many books. He had a brilliant intellect. He was an Oxford scholar. He knew philosophy. He knew the, the latest thought of his day. But he could say, because of its preeminence in his life, I am a man of one book. And, of course, that one book is the Scriptures. But it's fascinating how some Methodists and some Christians tried to do Christianity with very little Scripture. It was probably about 15 years ago I made a trip with my family to the West Coast. I was uh, participating in a conference there, and after the conference in Los Angeles, we, we rented a convertible and drove up the Pacific Coast Highway to San Francisco. And we attended a very, very prominent United Methodist Church there in San Francisco. I won't call it by name since this is being live streamed. Many people would know this church well and they will probably be able to figure out what church I'm talking about. If you know anything about 
Methodism in San Francisco. Anyway, we worshiped in this very prominent church. The music was phenomenal. The crowd was vibrant. It was a packed sanctuary. No scripture was read during that worship service. The only scripture that finagled its way into that worship service was at one point, uh, the preacher who's very famous, the preacher who's very famous, referenced part of one verse from, the, from one psalm just to prove his case that, that David liked to party. And that was the only scripture that finagled its way to the worship service that morning. And really what, what bothered me more was after the sermon, if you call it that, after the sermon, I watched a baptism. And I watched a baptism, this is 15 years ago, I watched a baptism in United Methodist Church where the Trinity was not even mentioned or named. So not only was Scripture not referenced there in that worship service, Scripture hadn't informed that worship service very well. They did the baptism and talked a lot about God's love and God's inclusive love and how God is beckoning everyone to come into the kingdom, but never mentioned Father, Son, and Spirit. They did use some water, but never mentioned Father, Son, and Spirit. I remember um, my kids who were teenagers at that point, when we were leaving, they, they said, Dad, what was that? And I just said, well, it's a different part of the country from us. Um, some Christians try to do Christianity without the Bible. Some Methodists try to do Christianity without the Bible. Um, I'm so thankful to be here at Wesley Memorial Church. The Bible's really important to us here at Wesley Memorial Church. You notice, if you've been around here for a while, we spend a lot of time with Scripture. Uh, It's central to the way we do worship. It informs our worship. Um, Scripture texts make prominent appearances in our worship. We have opportunities throughout the week for Bible study. We actually even do something that I'm not sure you notice unless you travel around to a lot of other United Methodist churches, but I'm going to make sure you're aware of it. After we read Scripture, we say something that goes back to the earlier days of the Christian community, goes back to what we have said in our liturgy for hundreds of years, till recent years. We just, after the reading of Scripture, we make that proclamation, this is the Word of God. People respond, thanks be to God. The historic way of doing it is just like we do it. This is the Word of God or the Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Just in recent decades, it's gotten popular in some churches, and words are important, at least they are to me, and I think they are to you. In some churches, what you will hear, after the reading of Scripture, you will hear, this is the Word of God for the people of God. In other words, there's sort of a caveat there. This is the Word of God for those who want it to be. This is the Word of God for those who have received it. But that's not the way the historic church has responded to Scripture. The historic church has always said, this is the Word of God, period. It's the Word of God whether you accept it or not. It's the Word of God whether you receive it or not. It is objectively the Word of God. And that's the way the church has responded to the reading of Scripture for almost 1,800 years. But recently that got changed a little bit because we didn't want to offend other people who have other scriptures. So we just said this is the word of God for the people of God, for the people who have sort of voted to receive it. I'm so grateful to be here at Weston Memorial Church. The scriptures are central to who we are. Bible studies happen throughout the week. And our children and youth ministries, youth ministries here, are, are, are focused on Scripture. Now, they do the fun stuff. They do the trips. They do all the stuff that you need to do to sort of keep uh, children and youth engaged. But the people that lead our ministries here with children and youth are very focused on making sure our children and youth are raised to know the Jesus Christ of the Scriptures and to know the God of the Scriptures. I'm so grateful to be here at Wesley Memorial Church where we really give the Bible its preeminent place in our life. 
So let me just say a few words, and I'm making my way to the prophecy of Micah. Let me say a few words about the Bible in general. Now that we've talked about the Bible a little bit in general, let me just say a few things about the Bible. To understand the Bible, you need to understand that from a Christian perspective, the Bible is a book about Jesus. From our earliest days in the Christian community, we find Jesus throughout all the Old Testament, and particularly you see that around the Christmas season. You see the, the prophecies about Jesus. You see simple things like when the Holy Family goes to Egypt, uh, Matthew will pull a verse out of the book of Hosea that says, I called my child from Egypt. And we say, yeah, that's Jesus. That's the Holy Family. That was written about the Holy Family. So we Christians have always lived life through Jesus-shaped lenses, but we've always read all of Scripture through Jesus-shaped lenses. I know I was taught very young that the way to understand the Bible is that in the Old Testament, Jesus is predicted. In the Gospels, Jesus is revealed. In the book of Acts, Jesus is preached. In the epistles, Jesus is explained. And in the book of Revelation, Jesus is expected. So for those of us in the Christian community, the Bible is eminently a book about Jesus, not just New Testament, from, but from the beginning and from the beginning to the end. And you see that particularly in Christmas, the way we use Old Testament prophecies. We believe the Bible is, is a book that was written, written by God. That's why we always have declared for almost 2,000 years now, the Word of God, thanks be to God. Now, God is the author of Scripture, but God uses human beings. God has used human beings to write Scripture. God uses human beings, used human beings to write Scripture, so we see their personalities coming through in Scripture. You know, before Paul wrote what Paul wrote that became what we call New Testament Scripture, God had formed Paul so that Paul could write what, what God wanted him to write. So the Bible is written by both God and his human instruments. But we believe that God is preeminently the author of Scripture, and that's why in the Christian community we believe that there is a remarkable harmony and consistency throughout all the Bible. And that's why we read all of the books in the Bible. We've accepted all of the books in Old Testament and New Testament because we believe they all point toward the same God and the same revelation of God in Jesus Christ. Christ. The Bible, of course, is a book unlike any other. Now, we know that the Bible has been the number one bestseller um, throughout Western history, but we also know that the Bible is unlike any other book because we know that the Bible changes lives. We have an existential, experiential relationship to the Bible, and for 2,500 years now, the scriptures have changed lives. The Bible is a book unlike any other books. It's in this book that we hear God speaking to us. The surest way to know the will of God, the desires of God, is to read this book. Then comes one last thing I want to say before we take a moment to look at Micah's prophecy. We, we ask ourselves, or at least we should ask ourselves frequently, how should we interpret the Scriptures? Ever since the Enlightenment in the 18th century, there have been a lot of people who try to just discount the Bible by saying something like, well, everybody interprets it their own way. Everybody interprets it differently, and that just sort of excuses any reference to the Bible. And again, we Christians have been working with this book for a really long time. And we say that there is a way to interpret Scripture that, that creates the consensus of the Christian faith, that creates what we call the Nicene or the Apostles' Creed. There is a way to read Scripture that can do that. We basically need to remember that when we go to Scripture, we need to make sure that, we need to make sure that the plain stuff is the main stuff when we're talking about Scripture. In other words... We need to let the, let the less clear passages of the Bible be interpreted by the more clear passages of the Bible. There's a lot throughout the Scriptures that are preeminently clear 
And that's why we've been able to use this book for Christian doctrine, for faith, and for practice. We need to take what's written in the Bible the way it was intended to be taken. If it's poetry, that means we look at it a certain way. If it's, if it's prose or historical record, we look at it a certain way. We take the Bible the way it was meant to be written by the author that God used to write the Scripture. And we also interpret Scripture by using other Scripture to interpret Scripture. We've been doing this since day one. We use other Scripture to interpret Scripture um, because we do believe that there's a consistency. We do believe that there's a harmony throughout the Scriptures. And again, we use those clearer passages of Scripture to interpret the less clear passages of Scripture. So with all of that being said, look at Micah chapter 5. Just one verse I want to point out to you because we spend so much time during the Advent season looking at these prophecies from people like Micah and Isaiah and Zephaniah and Malachi and others. We spend so much time looking at their prophecies. You sort of know how we use these prophecies, but I, I think I've tried to make it crystal clear how we use these prophecies this, this morning. Look at verse 2, chapter 5 of Micah. And this was written somewhere between 750 and 700 years B.C., before Christ. And God, speaking through Micah, said, But you, O Bethlehem Ephratah, Ephratah is a more ancient name for Bethlehem. Those of you that are doing the Monday morning study on the book of Ruth, you've noticed that Naomi and her husband Elimelech were called Ephrathites. And after they're called Ephrathites, you see in the book that they come from Bethlehem. But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me or from me, one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. So here we are being told that when Messiah comes, when this ruler that comes who will make the ultimate deliverance of God's people, this, this one will come from Bethlehem. And Bethlehem was such a small little village, it was so insignificant. It was only about five miles, it is only about five miles outside of Jerusalem, but particularly in the time of Jesus, that was a long trip, those five miles from Jerusalem to Bethlehem. It was just a tiny little inconsequential village, except David, King David had been found there. And the prophet Micah said that the one who is to come from the line of David will be born there. You know, in the Christmas story, Mary and Joseph live where? They live in Nazareth. But according to Luke chapter 2, it's the taxation that Caesar Augustus called for that led them to make that journey from Nazareth down to Bethlehem. And it was in Bethlehem where the Messiah was born. It was not because of Caesar's taxation. Caesar was just being a pawn of Almighty God to get the Holy Family into Bethlehem because that's where God had already spoken that Messiah would be born. It was such a tiny, inconsequential village. Whenever I take groups to Israel, uh, now we go to Bethlehem and you go to the Church of the Nativity. And the Church of the Nativity is the oldest Christian church in continuous existence. We go into that church and we go downstairs to the cave uh, that supposedly is the spot where Jesus was born. We do know from other literature outside the Bible, Jesus was born in a cave because he was born in Bethlehem, which is in the Middle East. There's not a lot of wood in the Middle East. Our nativity scenes that we have were created in Italy to begin with in the 12th century. And they thought, you know, they built stables out of wood, so they thought Jesus' people must have built stables out of wood, but they actually used caves. There's more rock in the Middle East than wood. And that's why underneath the Church of the Nativity, there's a cave. And you go down in that cave, and um, you celebrate the birth of Jesus. Great place to sing Christmas carols. You go down in that cave, but of course, and you probably have seen this, there's a star on the floor of that cave, and particularly the residents of Bethlehem, will say Jesus was born 
right there in that spot. Well, usually people will look at me and say, Jeff, was he born on that spot? And I always say, well, who knows? Um, but I can always say this, the Church of the Nativity is big enough that the Church of the Nativity covers the whole site of ancient Bethlehem. So the church obviously sits upon the site of Jesus' birth. The city of Bethlehem was such a tiny, inconsequential city. The only thing I had going for it was David was found there, and I, I'm sure that shocked people when the new king was discovered by the prophet Samuel there in Bethlehem. But Bethlehem was an almost unknown city. But you know, God delights in taking insignificant, small, inconsequential people or things or places and doing a great work out of it. You remember in Matthew chapter 2 when the Magi, we usually say three wise men, but they were, they were Persian astrologers. They were following the star and they um, followed the star almost to Bethlehem. They stopped in the big city of Jerusalem and they asked King Herod, where has this new king been born? And you remember the story of the, the Magi heard from the religious scholars there in Jerusalem that this new king was to be born in Bethlehem next door. So they knew by the time of Jesus that when the Messiah would come, the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. God loves to use significant, insignificant, simple, inconsequential people and places to do his great work. Charles Haddon Spurgeon was one of the great preachers of the 19th century. He was called the Prince of Preachers. He pastored the biggest church during his age in London, the Metropolitan Tabernacle, and he was the most listened to and most read preacher of his age. And frequently when he would tell his testimony, when he would talk about his coming to Christ, he would talk about a lady named Mary King. He would talk about how when he was still a teenager, he went to work for a particular school. And this was as God was moving him into ministry as a very, very young man. And there in that particular school, he met the cook who cooked for the students. And her name was Mary King. A very simple woman in so many ways. But Mary King knew the Lord. Mary King loved her Bible. And Mary King had a huge influence on many of the students and instructors at that school in Cambridgeshire, including Charles Haddon Spurgeon. And after Charles Haddon Spurgeon became a famous, the most famous preacher of his age, he frequently would say he learned all the theology he needed to learn. There from Mary King, that simple cook in that small, out-of-the-way school. God delights to use the simple, the insignificant, to do great things because God delights, as Paul says, to confound our wisdom, to make sure that, that we understand the ways of God are not our ways, that's why God would take a place like Bethlehem and allow the ruler of the universe to come into this world there in that place in Bethlehem. So why Bethlehem? That's the way God designed it. That's the way God prophesied it would happen 700 years before it ever happened. I recently saw someone post on Facebook, and I appreciate the sentiment, it showed a picture of the manger, and it said the world was saved by an unplanned pregnancy. Appreciate the sentiment, but it was not unplanned. I believe it was planned before the foundations of the earth that Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, Jesus, the Son of God, Jesus, the one that Micah has said comes from of old, in that text I just read for you, took flesh there in Bethlehem, but he was part of the Godhead from all eternity. He was planned from of old, and his birth taking place in that little town village of Bethlehem was in the heart of God before anyone, anyone ever knew it. 
So why Bethlehem? That's the way God planned it. And God's always at work, even when we don't see what he's doing or recognize what he's doing. So Bethlehem, Ephrata, you are the smallest of all the clans in Judah, but from you will come the one from me, God says. From you will come the one who has been from of old, from ancient days. May I pray with you? God, we acknowledge that it takes your Holy Spirit working with us to help us receive what you have for us in your word. May we reverence your word. May we always seek the, the aid of your spirit in interpreting your word. May your word have its prominent place in this church. May your word have its prominent place in our lives. We thank you, God, that you are who you are. And we thank you, God, that we know your character because you are a God who has spoken to us. You are a God that has revealed yourself to us. You are a God who has revealed yourself to us through Scripture, and then ultimately you've revealed yourself to us through Jesus Christ. You are such a great, great God that you desire to be in relationship with each one of us. So, great God, we pray that we will always welcome Jesus Christ to rule and reign in our lives. May we speak like Jesus, think like Jesus, serve like Jesus, but above all else, pay homage to Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.